Hello everybody and welcome to another reading on Babylon Mr. Religion with Joggler66 from Hour of the Truth. Today we have arrived at chapter 12 which is called Papal Immorality and uh, I read chapter 12, 13 and 14 the last days in preparation of this and this is really something of the part of the book that you don't want to miss, I'm quite sure. So, let's lay back pay attention and let's see how the Roman Catholic Church exposes itself more and more and more as the Antichrist of the Bible. Papal immorality we read in chapter 12 of the book from Ralph Woodrow. In addition to the conclusive evidence that has been given, the very character and morals of many of the popes would tend to identify him, them as successors of S.U.N. sun worship priests rather than the representatives of Christ or Peter, which we already spoke about, that of course he was not the successor of Peter. Some of the popes were so depraved and base in their actions, even people who professed no religion at all were ashamed of them. Such sins as adultery, Sodomy, simony, rape, murder and drunkenness are among the sins that have been committed by popes. And <coughs> I have to make a little note here, because, you know, in the book from Dave Hunt, which is called A Woman Rides the Beast, there is a whole chapter that goes into this subject very, very deeply and lets your hair and your neck stand up from unbelief how men like that could be popes. I mean, what people perceive to be what popes should be like, right? It should be mandatory for Catholics to read historic facts like this and then see with their own eyes who they really worship. To link such things, uh, to link such sins as adultery, sodomy, sinomy, rape, murder and drunkenness with men who have claimed to be the quote-unquote Holy Father the quote-unquote vicar of Christ and quote-unquote bishop of bishops may sound shocking, but those acquainted with the history of the papacy well know that not all popes were holy men. <laughs> not all popes were holy men? There is not one pope who ever was a holy man. They were all antichrists, the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist of the Bible and there is nothing holy about the vicar of Satan on earth. Pope Sergius III, who reigned between 904 and 911 AD, obtained the papal office by murder. The annals of the Church of Rome tell about his life of open sin with Morosia who bore him several illegitimate children. He was described by Baronius as a quote-unquote monster and by Gregorovius as a terrorizing criminal. Says a historian, quote, For seven years this man occupied the chair of St. Peter, while his concubine and her Semiramis-like mother held court with a pomp and voluptuousness that recalled the worst days of the ancient empire. Unquote. This woman, Theodora, likened to Semiramis because of her corrupt morals, along with Morosia, the Pope's concubine, quote, filled the papal chair with their paramours and bastard sons and, turned, and turned the papal palace into a den of robbers, unquote. What did Jesus say to, this <coughs> to the merchandisers who were in the temple? You've made my holy place a den of thieves and the papal palace is turned into a den of robbers? Do you see any similarity there? Hmm? The reign of Pope Sergius III began in the period known as quote-unquote the rule of the harlots between 904 and 963 AD. So Pope John X between 19, 914 and 928 originally had been sent to Ravanna as an archbishop, but Theodora had him returned to Rome and appointed to the papal office. 
According to Bishop Louis Prandt of Cremona, who wrote a history about 50 years after this time, quote, Theodora supported John's election in order to cover more easily her illicit relations with him, unquote. His reign came to a sudden an end when Merosia smothered him to death. She wanted him out of the way so Leo VI, who reigned between 928 and 929, could become Pope. His reign, as we just read, one year, was a short one, however, for he was assassinated by Merosia when she learned he had, quote, given his heart to a more degraded woman than herself, unquote. Not long after this, the teenage son of Merosia, under the name of John XI, became Pope. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, Some, taking Luitprandt and the Liber Pontificalis as their authority, assert that he was the natural son of Sergius III, a former Pope, as we've just read. Through the intrigues of his mother, who ruled at that time in Rome, he was raised to the chair of Peter. But in quarreling with some of his mother's enemies, he was beaten and put into jail, where he died from poisoning. End quote. In 955, the grandson of Morosia, at 18 years of age, became Pope, under the name of John XII. The Catholic Encyclopedia describes him as, quote, a coarse, immoral man, whose life was such that the Lateran was spoken of as a brothel, and the moral corruption in Rome became the subject of general odium. On November 6th, a synod composed of 50 Italian bishops was convened in St. Peter's. John was accused of sacrilege, simony, perjury, murder, adultery and incest, and was summoned in writing to defend himself. Refusing to recognize the synod, John pronounced sentence of excommunication against all participators in the assembly, should they elect in his stead another pope. John XII took bloody vengeance on the leaders of the opposite party. Cardinal Deacon John had his right hand struck off. Bishop Otgar of Speyer was scorched. A high Palatine official lost nose and ears. John died on May 14, 964, eight days after he had been, according to rumor, stricken by paralysis in the act of adultery. Unquote. The noted Catholic bishop, bishop of Cremona, Louis Brandt, who lived at this time, wrote, quote, No honest lady dared to show herself in public, for Pope John had no respect either for single girls, married women or widows. They were sure to be defiled by him, even on the tombs of the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, unquote. The Catholic collection of the life of popes, the, quote, Liber Pontificalis, unquote, said, quote, he spent his entire life in adultery, unquote. Pope Boniface VII, 984 through 985, that he reigned, also only one year, maintained his position through a lavish distribution of stolen money. The Bishop of Orléans referred to him, and also John XII and Leo VIII, as, quote, monsters of guilt, reeking in blood and filth, unquote, and as, quote, antichrist, sitting in the temple of God, unquote. You see, it is not only the Protestants, it is not only the Bible-believing true Christians who call the Pope antichrist, he was also called antichrist here in this case, by the Bishop of Orléans. The Catholic Encyclopedia says he, quote, overpowered John XIV in April 984, thrust him into the dungeons of St. Angelo, where the wretched man died four months later. For more than a year Rome endured this monster steeped in the blood of his predecessors. But the vengeance was terrible. After a sudden death in July 985, due in all probability to violence, the body of Boniface was exposed to the insults of the populace, dragged through the streets of the city, and finally, naked and covered with wounds, flung under the statue of Marcus Aurelius. 
The following morning, compassionate clerics removed the corpse and gave it a quote-unquote Christian burial. Unquote. A Christian burial. Burial. No, a Roman Catholic burial. An Antichrist burial that has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Next came Pope John the Fifteenth between 985 and 996, who split the church's finances among his relatives and earned for himself the reputation of being, quote, covetous of filthy lucre and corrupt in all his acts, unquote. Benedict VIII, who reigned between 1012 and 1025, quote, bought the office of Pope with open bribery. Unquote. The following Pope, John the Nineteenth, also bought the papacy. You know, when you buy the chair of the papacy, that is called simony, and there are numerous, numerous examples of people who did that. Being a layman, it was necessary for him to be passed through all the clerical orders in one day. After this, Benedict the Ninth, between 1033 and 1045 was made Pope as a youth, 12 years old. Well, some accounts say maybe 20. Either way, 12 or 20 is still a little bit young to be so-called the successor of Peter and so-called the Vicar of Christ, don't you think? Through a money bargain with the powerful families that ruled Rome. He, quote, committed murders and adulteries in broad daylight, robbed pilgrims on the graves of the martyrs, a hideous criminal, the people drove him out of Rome. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, he was a disgrace to the chair of Peter, unquote. Simony. The buying and selling of the papal office became so common and corruption so pronounced that secular rulers stepped in. King Henry III appointed Clement II between 1046 and 47 to the office of Pope, quote, because no Roman clergyman could be found who was free of the pollution of simony and fornication, unquote. A number of the popes had committed murders, but Innocent III, who reigned between 1198 and 1216, surpassed all of his predecessors in killing. Though he did not do the killing personally, he promoted the most devilish thing in human history, the Inquisition. Estimates of the number of heretics that Innocent, who was not so innocently, had killed run as high as one million people in this few years of his reign, 18 years, killing a million people. Now. For the first time here in the book, we have now the mentioning of the Office of the Inquisition. And people say, oh, that was a thousand years ago, that was 500 years ago, 600 years ago. We don't do that anymore. We are civilized now, aren't we? Well, the Office of the Inquisition is today called the Office of the Congregation of the Faith. And Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who stepped down as Pope in 2013, as you all know, before Pope Francis, the first Jesuit Pope, jumped in, was the chairman. He was leading the Congregation of the Faith, the Inquisition, today. And it is not because you don't see the dungeons anymore that there are no inquisitions anymore. Absolutely not. The inquisitions of today are the wars of today. And World War I and World War II, which was actually just one world war with a 20-year truce in between it, according to uh, Field Marshal Foch, the Allied commander of the Entente at the First World War, this one war was nothing else than counter-reformation. It was an inquisitional and inquisitory war, like all the wars are fomented 
by the military order of the Vatican, the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus. And to go on on the Inquisition, you have to understand that until the middle of the uh, 70s of last century, the 1970s, the Inquisition was still using all the different apparatus for torture that we know of of the Middle Ages. They were still in use until Franco, the Spanish fascist dictator, died in, I think it was 1976, if I'm not mistaken. I still remember, like I said already in another video, one day that I went to school, I was about 10 years old at that time, that I told one of my comrades I went to school with, I said, oh, did you hear that Franco died? And I had no idea who he was. <laughs> Yeah, it took me almost another 40 years to come to that knowledge, what kind of person that was. But I know that I've heard the news that morning in the radio. Franco died, and they made just a big point out of it. I don't know why. Well, today I know why. Then at the time I didn't know. But if you think that the Inquisition is gone today, think of the NDAA and the Patriot Act and all the laws that take away your civil liberties in the United States of America today after 9-11 happened, where you can be picked up on the streets without any official accusation, without any witnesses and without any trial and without any chance of defending yourself or even knowing what you're, uh, what you're accused of being transported into one of the modern dungeons like Guantanamo Bay or another secret prison the United States military or secret services have all over the world. If you think that we know that uh, that we know everything what is going on today, think again. The Inquisition is very much alive. And okay, the name changed in the Roman Catholic Church because now they call it the Congregation of the Faith, but that doesn't change the fact that the Inquisition still is working. So the author continues, For over 600 years, popes used the Inquisition to maintain their power against those who did not agree with the teachings of the Roman Church. And by this you have to remember that when the Society of Jesus was founded in 1540, two years later, as I read in uh, Rulers of Evil from F. Tapasorsi, the Jesuits were taken over from the Jacobines who did that before, the Inquisition. In 1542 they agreed to the terms to take over the Inquisition. And let me assure you, those terms didn't soften the Inquisition at that time. And it didn't soften the Inquisition until today. But instead of going from town to town and driving the Protestants out of their houses, today they are just doing so-called war. Did you ever ask yourself why after World War II and even during World War II, the wars all of a sudden turned against the civil population of the countries. It started in Germany, and of course it went on in Japan with throwing of the two, two nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those weren't military goals. Those were civil goals. Just remember you, of the firestorms that were in Dresden, in Hamburg, in Munich, and in Cologne and other German cities during World War II, killing hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. That has nothing to do with war as we know it, but that has everything to do, everything, with the Inquisition as we can know it. But, okay, the author continues here in this page. In conflicts with cardinals and kings, numerous charges were brought against Pope Boniface VIII, who reigned between 1294 and 1303. And I want to remind you that this Pope Boniface VIII, in 1302, published the bull Unang 
Unam Sanctam. And if you don't know that, look that up in the Catholic Encyclopedia or on any Catholic or Vatican website. Unam Sanctam, the bull, where Pope Innocent the uh, Pope Boniface VIII declared that it is absolutely necessary for every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. What does that have to do with the Inquisition, you ask? Well, isn't it obvious? If you do not agree to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, you are not saved by the Roman Catholic Church, but you are persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. Whenever you do not agree with the teachings and dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, the seat of Antichrist, you will be persecuted. And that is still until today. Only when you are agreeable in the Roman Catholic Church and being a subject to the Roman Pontiff, he is satisfied. And anybody else who does not agree with that is a heretic and is even a meritorious work for Roman Catholics to kill a heretic until today. Because they also teach that without the shedding of blood there is no salvation. So for them to get salvation they have to kill heretics through Bible-believing Christians, first and for all. Now says the Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, Scarcely any possible crime was omitted. Infidelity, heresy, simony, gross and unnatural immorality, idolatry, making loss of the Holy Land, etc., etc. Protestant historians generally, and even modern Catholic writers, class him among the wicked popes, as an ambitious, haughty and unrelenting man, deceitful also and treacherous, his whole pontificate, one record of evil." Unquote. Pope Boniface VIII. Quote, it is not necessary to insist that all charges brought against him were true, but all cannot be dismissed either. During his reign the poet Dante visited Rome and described the Vatican as a quote-unquote sewer of corruption, unquote. He assigned Boniface, along with Popes Nicholas III and Clement V, to quote, the lower, par the lower parts of hell, unquote. Though seeking to put emphasis on certain good traits of Boniface, <laughs> I don't know what good traits you can find on any Antichrist, Quote, Catholic historians admit, however, the explosive violence and offensive phraseology of some of his public documents. Unquote. An example of this quote unquote, offensive phraseology would be his statement that quote, to enjoy oneself and to lie carnally with women or with boys is no more a sin than rubbing one's hands together. Unquote. On another occasion, apparently in those explosive moment, movement, moments, he called Christ a hypocrite and professed to be an atheist. To enjoy oneself and to lie carnally with women or with boys is no more a sin than rubbing one's hands together, Pope Boniface stated. Lying with boys. Here you have an absolute admission that for the Roman Catholic Church pedophilia is nothing else than just rubbing one's hands together. And is that a crime? Do you maybe now understand this worldwide abomination of this pedophilia host from the priests of Rome? Where in every town where the Roman where there is a Roman Catholic Church, there is also abuse of children, most and for all young boys. You really have to think about this, eh? So, as I already mentioned, we come to this next 
thing uh, after uh, that he on uh, other occasions in those explosive moments he called Christ a hypocrite and professed to be an atheist, we go further to something that I already mentioned just before. Yet, and this sounds almost unbelievable, it was this Pope that in 1302 issued the well-known Unam Sanctum, which officially declared that the Roman Catholic Church is the only true Church outside of which no one can be saved, and says, quote, We therefore assert, define and pronounce that it is necessary to salvation to believe that every human being is subject to the pontiff of Rome, unquote, as I already said before. They say that outside of the Roman Catholic Church no one can be saved. What did our Lord say? I am the way, the truth and the life and nobody comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the Bible, not the Jesus Christ of the Roman Catholic Church, which is Tammuz. There is no salvation outside of Jesus and his blood that he already shed, and not inside the Roman Catholic Church with all the blood that they are still shedding all over the world. Catholics should really read their Bible for once and look things like this up and just compare the teachings of God with the teachings of the so-called placeholder of God on earth, the Pope, and see where it doesn't make any sense at all what the Pope says when you compare it to the Word of God. Now, because there have been sinful popes, <laughs> there has not been a, a pope without any sins, because popes are men, and man is full of sins from the beginning. We are born in trespasses and sins, the Bible teaches us. So because there have been sinful popes, being subject to the pope has raised a question. Should a sinful pope still be obeyed? Now, listen to this. The Catholic answer is this, quote, A sinful Pope remains a member of the visible Church and is to be treated as a sinful, unjust ruler for whom we must pray, but for from whom we may not withdraw our obedience, unquote. I have to read this again. Let this sink in very well. A sinful Pope remains a member of the Church and is to be treated as, un, uh, as an unjust ruler for whom we must pray, but from whom we may not withdraw our obedience. In other words, even though we know that our so-called leader is full of sins, we still have to be obedient to him. Is that what Christ teaches? I don't think so, eh? <clears throat> From 1305 to 1377, the Papal Palace was at Avignon in France. And for the people who know a little bit about wine and that region, this is where we derive the wine Chateauneuf du Pape from, meaning the Pope's new castle. They were all lovers of wines from Burgundy, the wine region today just above the Rhone region where chateauneuf de pape is situated. So they took the Pope out of, Saint, uh, uh, out of the Vatican in Rome, put him to Avignon and built even for him a complete new city called chateauneuf de pape the Pope's new castle. During this time, Petrarch used the papal household of, quote, accused the papal household, sorry, uh, Petrarch accused the papal household of, quote, rape, adultery, and all manner of fornication, unquote. In many parishes, men insisted on priests keeping concubines, quote, as a protection for their own families, unquote. Do you get this? 
In parishes, men insisted on priests keeping concubines as a protection for their own families, so they can get rid of their seed wherever and whenever they want to, trying maybe to even stop the pedophilia at that time. Trying to oblige <laughs> to make them go with concubines. Hey, if you want to lose your seed, then lose it there. And don't rape our children and our wives and our daughters and our young men. This is so, so wrong. And many parishes men insisted on priests keeping concubines. Yeah, Ho Rome is a complete whorehouse. It's a brothel. During the Council of Constance, three popes, yeah, You've listened correctly. Three popes, and sometimes four, were every morning cursing each other and calling their opponents antichrists, demons, adulterists, sodomists, enemies of God and man. One of these popes, John the Twenty-Third, who reigned between 1410 and 1415, not to be confused with the 20th century Pope, who took the same name and number, by the way, quote, was accused by 37 witnesses, mostly bishops and priests, of fornication, adultery, incest, sodomy, simony, theft and murder. It was proved by a legion of witnesses that he had seduced and violated 300 nuns. His own secretary, Niem, said that he had at Boulogne kept a harem where not less than 200 girls had been the victims of his lubricity." Unquote. Altogether, the council charged him with 54 crimes of the worst kind. A Vatican record offers this information about his immoral reign. Quote, his Lordship, Pope John, committed perversity with the wife of his brother, incest with holy nuns, intercourse with virgins, adultery with the married, and all sorts of sex crimes, wholly given to sleep and, and, uh, and other carnal desires, totally adverse to the life and teaching of Christ. He was publicly called the devil incarnate." Unquote. To increase his wealth, Pope John taxed about everything, including prostitution, gambling and usury. He has been called, quote, the most depraved criminal who ever sat on the papal throne, unquote. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think that is actually an account that counts for every Antichrist sitting on the papal throne and declaring himself to be God on earth. Pope Pius II, who reigned between 1458 and 1464, was said to have been the father of many illegitimate children. He, quote, spoke open, openly of the methods he used to seduce women, encouraged young men too, and even offered to instruct them in methods of self-indulgence, unquote. Pius was followed by Paul II between 1464 and 1471, who maintained a house full of concubines. His papal tiara outweighed a palace in its worth. Next came Pope Sixtus IV between 1471 and 1484, who financed his wars by selling church offices to the highest bidders and, quote, used the papacy to enrich himself and his relatives. He made eight of his nephews cardinals, while as yet some of them were mere boys. In luxurious and lavish entertainment he rivaled the Caesars. In wealth and pomp he and his relatives surpassed the old Roman families." Unquote. Pope Innocent VIII between 1484 and 1492 was the father of 16 children by various women. Some of his children celebrated their marriages in the Vatican. 
the Catholic Encyclopedia. Listen, this is, it, it, it's from their own mouth, from their own encyclopedia. Mentions only, quote, two illegitimate, ch illegitimate children, Francis Cato and Theodorina, unquote, from the days of a licentious youth. Like numerous other popes, he multiplied church offices and sold them for vast sums of money. He permitted bullfights on St. Peter's Square. Next came Rodrigo Borgia, who took the name of Alexander VI between 1492 and 1503, having won his election to the papacy by bribing the cardinals. It's called simony. Before becoming pope, while a cardinal and archbishop, he lived in sin with the lady of Rome, Venosa de Cantanae, and afterwards with her daughter Rosa, by whom he had five children. On his coronation day, he appointed his son, a youth of vile temper and habits, as Archbishop of Valencia. Many consider Alexander VI to be the most corrupt of the Renaissance popes. He lived, in a pub, uh, he lived in public incest with his two sisters and his own daughter, Lucretia, from whom, it is said, he had a child. On October 31st, 1501, he conducted a sex orgy in the Vatican, a banquet with featured, which featured 50 nude girls who danced and serviced guests. And they didn't serve only drink and food and offered prizes to the man who could copulate the most times. October 31st, 16 years later, becomes Reformation Day, the day when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door of Wittenberg. 1501, we read of this sex orgy in the Vatican with 50 nude girls who danced and serviced guests. That's quite an orgy, but very fitting for the Antichrist of the Bible. According to Life magazine, Pope Paul III, who reigned between 1534 and 1549, and don't forget, this is the Pope who ordained the Society of Jesus in 1540, as a cardinal had fathered three sons and a daughter. On the day of his coronation, he celebrated the baptism of his two great-grandchildren. He appointed two of his teenage nephews as cardinals, sponsored festivals with singers, dancers and jesters, and sought advice from astrologers. Also something God absolutely condemns. Now we come to Pope Leo X, the persecutor of Martin Luther, who reigned between 1513 and 1521. He was born December 11, 1475. He received tonsure at age 7, was made an abbot at age 8, and a cardinal at 13 years of age. The Catholic Encyclopedia says that Pope Leo X, quote, gave himself up unrestrainedly to amusements that were provided in lavish abundance. He was possessed by an insatiable love of pleasure. He loved to give banquets and expensive entertainments, accompanied by reverie and carousing." Unquote. The picture that I will put in the video here given shows the bull of Pope Leo X. On one side of the leaden seal appears the Apostles Peter and Paul, on the other the Pope's name and title. The word bull, as you probably know already, from a Latin word linked with roundness, was first applied to the seals which authenticated papal documents, and later to the documents also. That's why we speak of papal bulls, like I said, this unam sanctam, which is a bull. Today we commonly use the word bulletin, which stems from the same source. According to Life magazine, Pope Paul III, as I mentioned, who reigned uh, already also, who reigned between 1534 and 1549, uh, the Pope of the Society of Jesus, as Cardinal, 
had fathered three sons and a daughter. How, how about the celibacy they preach? Huh? How does that go together? On the day of his coronation, he celebrated the baptism of his two great-grandchildren. He appointed two of his teenage nephews as cardinals, sponsored festivals with singers, dancers and jesters, and sought advice from astrologers. I think I read this uh, little part already before, so this comes twice mentioned here. Sorry for that. During those days, Martin Luther, who I just mentioned for you a little bit before, while still a priest of the papal church, traveled to Rome. As he caught the first glimpse of the seven-hilled city, he fell to the ground and said, Holy Rome, I salute thee. He had not spent much time there, however, until he saw that Rome was anything but a holy city. Iniquity existed among all classes of the clergy. Priests told indecent jokes and used awful profanity even during Mass. The papal court was served at supper by twelve naked girls. Quote, no one can imagine what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. Unquote. Martin Luther said. And he continues, quote, They must be seen and heard to be believed. Thus, they are in the habit of saying, If there is a hell, Rome is built over it. Unquote. And this is a very famous quote we find from Martin Luther also in the History of Protestantism by Meryl Dobinia. One day during Luther's visit to Rome, he noticed a statue on one of the public streets that led to St. Peter's. The statue of a female pope. Because it was an object of disgust to the popes, no pope would ever pass down that certain street. Quote, I am astonished, said Luther, how the popes allow the statue to remain. Unquote. Forty years after Luther's death, the statue was removed by Pope Sixtus V. So if you don't study history, like in books like this, where things like these is reco uh, are recorded, and also the sources of these uh, books, you will never know that there was a female pope. But through, though the Catholic Encyclopedia regards the story of Pope Joan as a mere tale, it gives, still gives, it still gives the following summary from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Quote, After Leo IV, who reigned between 847 and 855, the Englishman John of Mainz occupied the papal chair two years, seven months and four days. He was, it is alleged, a woman. When a girl, she was taken to Athens in male clothes by her lover, and there made such progress in learning that no one was her equal. She came to Rome where she taught science, and thereby attracted the attention of learned men, and was finally chosen as Pope, but becoming pregnant... <laughs> so that's the first male pregnancy we have recorded in the world then. Becoming pregnant by one of her trusted attendants, she gave birth to a child during a procession from St. Peter's to the Lateran. There she died almost immediately, and it is said she was buried at the same place. Unquote. Was there really a female pope? Prior to the Reformation, which exposed so much errors in the, er, errors in the Romish Church, the story was believed by chroniclers, bishops, and by popes themselves. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, In the 14th and 15th centuries, this popess was already counted as an historical personage, whose existence no one doubted. She had a place among the carved busts, which stood at Siena Cathedral. Under Clement the, uh, the uh, seventh, between 1592 and 1595, and at his request, she was transformed to Pope Zacharias. The heretic Hus, heretic, yeah, from whom come the Hussites. He was a Bible-believing Protestant, a real Christian, 
as biblical Christianity ordains it to be, the heretic Huss, the author continues, in defense of his false doctrine before the Council of Constance, referred to the Popus and no one offered to question the fact of her existence. Unquote. Some have questioned how Pope Clement could have a female Pope named Joan quote unquote, transformed into a male Pope named Zacharias centuries after she had died. Having mentioned the gross immorality that has existed in the lives of some of the popes, we do not wish to leave the impression that all popes have been as bad as the ones mentioned. <laughs> Let me intervene here. The author says, Having mentioned the gross immorality that has existed in the lives of quote unquote, some of the popes, I say all of them, we do not wish to leave the impression but that all popes have been as bad as the one mentioned. I say, Jörg, Jörgler 66, Hour of the Truth tells you, I say they actually all were even worse than that, because they all were and still are today antichrists. And of course, when today they speak about the satanic rituals taking part in the Vatican, child sacrifices, blood sacrifices, sex orgies, defiling young children, male and female, with a pedophilia, and even using these children in sacrifices, blood sacrifices and everything else. Today, even though we have a much better so-called media to cover these things, we could know all these things if the media wasn't working for the papacy. As you probably know, that in Intermirifica, the Pope said that it is the Church's birthright to own all media. And therefore they do. But at that time that we are speaking here, about the 12, 13, 14, 15 and even probably 1600s, those doings of the popes, those atrocities were quite well written down and saved for later. That we can read about it today from different sources and even from the Roman Catholic sources themselves. So when the author said, that not all popes have been as bad as the ones mentioned here, I say they all were at least as bad as the ones mentioned there. Every pope is the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the little horn of Daniel's prophecy. But, the author continues, we do believe this evidence seriously weakens the doctrine of quote-unquote apostolic succession. <laughs> I guess so. The claim that, Roman, that the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church because it can trace a line of popes back to Peter. Well, in an earlier chapter we spoke about that and you know with mental reservation which Peter the popes talk of. Kind the firstborn, which the Hebrew word Peter means, the firstborn of Eve. Now, is this really an important point? If so, each of the popes, even those who were known to be immoral and cruel, must be included. There is even the possibility of a female pope to make the succession complete. But salvation is not dependent on tracing a line of popes back to Peter, or even on a system of religion claiming to represent Christ. Salvation is found in Christ himself, and only in Christ himself. I am the way, the truth and the life, and nobody comes to through the Father but by me, and the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us 2,000 years ago on the cross, to make us righteous with his blood that he spilled once and for all, and after that, 
the vision of Daniel 9 was sealed up and the 70th week was complete because Jesus Christ gave his life for all of us at the cross. Salvation is found in Christ and only in, in Christ himself. There is no other way. So please, my betrayed Catholic brethren, listen to this, read it for yourself, check the sources, do your own research, and kick the priests out of your life. Come out of her, my people, as God says in Revelation 18, verse 4. So, thank you very much for listening and watching to this video of uh, Babylon Mystery Religion, chapter 12. And I hope to see you next time at chapter 13, that I will probably connect with chapter 14, because that's a very short one. But if you found this one interesting, I can only ask you, stay put. Keep an eye on my channel and don't miss chapter 13. Because if you think this one was interesting, we are going into much more interesting things to come in chapter 13 and 14. Up to here, Jogla66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, wishing you all a nice day. God bless you, and until next time, do your own research and come back for more on Babylon Mystery Religion. Bye-bye.